What you're about to watch is a collection of videos that I originally posted on Instagram. If you're an Instagram user, you can find me at Squash Coach Philip. In addition to these videos that you're about to watch, I also post non-squash tips videos, uh, images themselves, and even occasional stories so you can follow my training on there. Hi everybody, I'm Philip, an ex-professional squash coach who now considers himself a video coach. I make content that hopefully you can't find on anywhere else on YouTube, and that's helping you to improve one video at a time. So the last video I made, which was in February for this type of thing, seemed fairly popular, so obviously here we are again. And I'm almost certainly going to do that into April and May. So as I said, they're just a collection of one minute, more or less videos, each of different tip ideas. Now, if you've got any doubts, you've got any questions, you've got any comments that you wanna make, don't hesitate to make them in the comment section. I reply to each and every comment. So feel free to do that and that's it. So let's just get started. Currently, the World Championships are on in Chicago. And unless you live outside of the European Union, you can't watch them uh, on uh, Facebook. And unless you have a PSA Squash TV subscription, you can't watch them. But you can watch the highlights. And watching the highlights is both really motivating, at least for me, but it's also incredibly interesting. And what I want you to notice is how often they lob from the front when they are under pressure. The lob can turn a very defensive situation into an attacking one. And as a club player, we need to be able to do that. And what that means is making sure that you don't just do it in matches, but you actually practice it as well. So play some boast and drives, but then throw in a lob perhaps, or make all of the front shots have to be lobs. So the only way you can win is by hitting a really good defensive lob. So watch some professional squash and lob from the front when you're under pressure. I've just watched the highlights of the World Championship semi-finals between Ali Farag and Simon Rosner, and I'm hoping that this comes under fair use of copyright law. Watch how Ali Farag completely slows down the ball when he's under pressure. Watch. He played a very slow, very high straight drive. He's back on the tee before Simon Rosner has got a chance to hit the ball. Any pressure that he is under has been negated. Don't get sucked into smacking the ball when you're under pressure. Hit it high, hit it slow. Give yourself time. The three videos this week will all be about stretching misconceptions. I will be making them into a much longer and a proper video, but here I just want to get you uh, thinking about them. The first misconception is that stretching is not heating up. I use the word heating up, not warming up, because I don't like the word warm. You should be sweating. If you are not sweating before you start stretching, your body is not ready. You should never stretch cold. And I can't tell you the number of times I've been at the back of court, somebody's arrived for their match, somebody still playing and what's the first thing they do they start stretching and they think that they're doing the right thing they think that they're preparing but they're not they're possibly injuring themselves or starting to injure themselves you should be hot and sweating before you even begin to stretch and you should stretch gently you shouldn't be doing this bouncing that's the 1970s don't do it now As I said, this week is all about stretching misconceptions and stretching misconception number two is that you should stretch after a match. And that is true, but I just want to be clear why. When you exercise, your muscles build up something called lactic acid. Lactic acid acts as a glue between the muscle fibers so that the next day you feel the aches and pains, all right? Stretching afterwards can help remove that acid, but that's a different type of stretching than trying to improve your flexibility. The stretching after a match is cooling down. So put some warm clothes on and do some light stretching, not bouncing. Ideally, you should have a foam roller or a massage stick, but I'll talk about that in the future. Don't think that you're improving your flexibility before or after the match. Before you're just getting prepared, after you're just making sure you cool down effectively. 
Time for the final stretching misconception, number three, and that is the more flexible you are, the better. That is not true, because flexibility without strength is more likely to cause you problems. There's that classic image of Gregory Gaultier reaching for the ball at the front, just like doing the splits but not touching the floor. That's a fantastic image, but he is incredibly strong. He's incredibly flexible, and he's incredibly strong. So if you're going to do flexibility work, you have to partner it with strength work at the same time. There is no point just doing one thing if you don't do the other you will probably be causing yourself more problems. And one final thing to remember is the body is a chain. All parts have to be flexible because if one part is flexible but the other part isn't, the weakest part of the chain will break. So make sure you stretch all parts of the body. There's plenty of information on YouTube about that. These are heart rate monitors. You use them to make sure that you're working hard enough, and if you're a little bit older, that you're not working too hard. You can buy them in many places. This was an expensive one and does a load of functions that I can't even remember. And this was a basic one that I bought from a supermarket for less than 23 euros. So don't think that you have to buy an expensive model. You use them if you are serious about improving your squash because if you're serious about improving your squash you should be serious about improving your fitness now there's plenty of information on the internet and on youtube about how to use them but the key for this video is to encourage you to go and buy one and to start using it even a basic one for you to just monitor during the matches go get and use a heart rate monitor These are resistance bands. They come in a variety of materials and thicknesses and strengths. And in general, squash players do a lot of work on the strength of their legs, but they don't do enough lateral movement. When you move around on the court, you move side to side a lot with little adjustment steps, and then you take that final lunge. And squash players train that final lunge, but they don't do enough work for those little steps. And these resistance bands can help that process. Forgive my clumsiness, but you put them around your ankles, and then you just move from side to side. Now I do 60 of these every day and I do both sides. What I haven't shown you here is that you can use them to pull your legs in by wrapping the band around a leg of a table or something very sturdy. It is possible to do forward and backward motions if you don't have access to any weights or any other facilities. Um, and you can see me doing that here. But the main reason for using these is that you can do the side to side lateral motions. And you can even carry them in your bag and use them as a warm up. Fitness is undoubtedly a vital part of squash. Almost every club player around the world would jump a league or two if they just got much fitter. But fitness, for most club players, is temporary. Injury, work or family commitments, getting older or any other number of reasons could result in a loss of fitness. Once you develop skill and match craft, they stay for life or at least take a lot longer to be lost. Take the time now to improve your technique and understanding and knowledge of gameplay and tactics. When you're fit, good technique will be used to its utmost. A player who is very fit but can't hit the ball properly and doesn't know what shot to play won't win very often. Keep this phrase in mind, skill is for life. So take the time now to develop it. I make these videos for club players and I know that club players don't have enough time to do everything that they want. Coaches like me say, oh, you should do your fitness work and then you should do your flexibility and then you should do your solo practice and your pairs drills and then you should have your practice matches and then your real matches. There's just no time for all of those things, not if you've got other commitments. So what you need to do is you need to maximize the time that you are on court. The next time you go to play a practice match or a club afternoon, wait until the first five points have been played and then for the next three points, make those rallies as long as possible. You will be improving two things. You will be improving your cardiovascular system. You will be getting fitter, but you will also be improving your mental strength. The idea that you're not going to give anything easy to your opponent. You can't spend as much time as you'd like to do training fitness work, so use the time that you have available. Join the dark side. At eight all in the fifth, why play safe?
Go for the cross court, Nick. Even if it's a good serve, only the brave will try. Only the courageous can feel the power of the dark side flowing through their veins and into the racket. When pushed into the corner, why return high and give yourself time? Go for the three wall, Nick. Glory awaits. When at the front, at full stretch, why play safe? Go for the winner. Come to the dark side. I've talked about a mantra before, but it's important enough to do it again. If you've seen my previous video, consider this a reminder. If this is new for you, listen carefully. In this case, a mantra consists of a phrase that you repeat to improve your concentration. Mine can be used by all levels of players and all styles of play, but feel free to create your own based on your personal circumstances. Mine consists of three elements. Watch the ball hit the strings. Not only will you hit better shots because you are better balanced, it will be harder for your opponent to read where you're going to hit it. Hit every shot with clear intention. Knowing exactly where you want the ball to go means it's more likely to get there. And stick to your game plan. Formulate a game plan before you go on court based on your strengths or weaknesses or your opponent's strengths or weaknesses. If you want to, you can write it on the side of the racket and I'll post this as an image after this video. Thanks for watching. To reach your potential as a squash player, you have to do more than just play. And there are plenty of different types of activities that you can do. Obviously squash is very focused on fitness and that's a huge part of it, but there are others. For the people who want to achieve their goals and reach their potential, they must take responsibility for their training. We're not all lucky enough to play at a facility that has a coach or has events organized. And if that's the case, what I encourage you to do is create your own drill squad. A drill squad is a group of like-minded people who have a similar standard. Not age or gender, but similar standard. Those people get together regularly and practice certain types of routines, drills, only hitting the ball to the back, only down the wall, three quarter court. There's plenty available for you to do, look on YouTube to find them. But I encourage you to create your drill squad. One of the first videos I made on the Instagram account was the go and get coaching. And it's been almost two months since I made that, so it's time to revisit the topic. Remember, getting face-to-face -face coaching is almost certainly the best thing you can do to improve your game. Now, if you did make the effort and you found some coaching, I'm, I'm genuinely interested to hear your experiences. Were they positive? Were they negative? What was difficult? What was easy? So please write to me directly or put, post a comment on this uh, post here. Now, if you didn't go and get coaching, was it because you made an excuse or do you have a genuine reason? If you made an excuse, then this is what this video is for again, to remind you, go and get coaching. But again, I'm genuinely interested to know why you didn't. Is there some reason that you didn't? Let me know in the comments. But if you haven't done it because you're lazy, go and get some coaching. Today's video was supposed to be about the knockup, but yesterday somebody in the squash subreddit wrote about getting hit in the eye with the ball and potentially losing a significant amount of their eyesight. We wish that person well. The reason for that person posting was to tell everybody to wear squash goggles. Now, eye injuries within squash are not very common, but they could be catastrophic. I paid 15 pounds for these Dunlop glasses and that's about the right price for most manufacturers. Compared to the price of all of the other equipment we buy, 15 pounds is very good value considering it could save your eyesight. If you are new to squash, this should be something that you don't even think twice about. Get a pair of goggles and use them all of the time. If you're like me, you've been playing squash longer than you can remember, making that transition is a little bit harder, but considering it's your eyesight, it's totally worth it. I commit in front of you now that I will wear my squash goggles as often as possible and you should do the same. Protect your eyes. 
If you think the content of my videos is useful, please consider subscribing to my channel and turn on notifications. This is a playlist of the technical aspects of squash, which probably interests you if you've watched this video. This is a video that YouTube thinks is a really good fit for you. Thanks for watching, and remember, do something every single day to improve your squash. See ya!